Why did Lynn Patton, the Trump administration's New York and New Jersey chief for housing and urban development, take the job? And what are her experiences of being a high-profile black woman working in the Trump administration? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Today we sit down with Lynn Patton, HUD Regional Administrator for New York and New Jersey, who also served in the Trump Organization for 10 years, most recently as Vice President of the Eric Trump Foundation. We discuss her role at HUD, her experiences living in New York public housing, and overall as a black conservative woman, and her take on the attacks on Secretary Carson, President Trump, his family, and supporters of the administration, especially by the legacy media. Uh, Lynn Patton, wonderful to have you on American Thought Thank Leaders. Thank you, Jan. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Lynn, you're the regional administrator for uh, HUD yes. here in New York and New Jersey, and that actually uh, is a pretty, pretty important role. You're actually implementing the President's and Secretary Carson's uh, policies here in this region, and it's the Correct. most populous one, is that right? Yes, it's definitely the most densely populated region in the country. Um, we service more HUD clients here in Region 2, which is New York and New Jersey, than any other region in the country. Um, a lot of those uh, clients of ours come from the New York City Public Housing Authority, which is NYCHA, as everybody knows. Right. It is the largest public housing authority in the Western Hemisphere, not just um, you know the United States, but North America. In fact, um, more people live in NYCHA public housing than uh, the entire city of Miami, which blows people's minds when I say that. But blows my mind. Yeah, it's true. And so if you think about that and the context in which they're living, um, could you imagine if, uh, for all intents and purposes, the city of Miami lost air conditioning for 80% of its residents, um, particularly elderly? That's what's happening every day in, in NYCHA. So. I don't even want to imagine that. So yeah. you, you know, about a month ago, you actually spent about a month living in NYCHA. Yes, I did. Um, and I guess you've had a little bit of time <laughs> maybe to reflect on your experience. I've heard a little bit about what you experienced in some mm -hmm. other interviews. Could, could you give us a rundown? Yeah, of course. Well, look, Jan, you cannot make decisions from a distance. You cannot make life-altering uh, decisions from an ivory tower in Washington, D.C., or a corner office at 26 Federal Plaza, where I am in New York City. Um, so you have to be on the ground, communicating, talking to, experiencing what, what folks are experiencing. And, and look, my idea was not a unique idea. There have been public officials that have done it. Um, you know, I decided to do it for an entire month um, because every time I go to a NYCHA Public Housing Authority property, they manage to clean up the lobby, the elevators are working, the trash is picked up on time. So I said to myself, well, what if I actually lived here? How would they actually take care of these residents um, better than when I'm not here? And unfortunately, my experiment came true, and every single property that I lived in um, residents were telling me that they have never seen um, the types of maintenance repairs done, um, even proactive uh, maintenance was done, things that haven't happened in decades. And it's, it's really sad because it obviously shouldn't take a federal official for that to happen. Right. And it also further compounds the fact that it's really not a money issue at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's gross mismanagement okay. and, and just not having enough people staffers to do the work, which is something that uh, the federal monitor that Secretary Carson has assigned is going to change. So um, you actually did experience some things which weren't all that terribly pleasant, despite this all this yeah. extra work that was done to make things so good for you. So I now know, for example, what it's like to shower in a mold-infested bathroom in tepid, discolored water. Um, that's lukewarm, if not cold. I know what it's like to try to fall asleep in an apartment where I know that the egress to escape in the event of a fire is, is blocked. Um, in fact, uh, we suffered a great tragedy uh, not too long ago, maybe a week ago at NYCHA. A family of six was lost, um, four of them children. And, you know, 
I would never say I told you so, but when I was living in public housing for a month, um, one of the very, f the second or third night I was there, I said to my host family, you know, I don't mean to frighten you, but um, I can't help but notice that you have to go through your kitchen to leave. If there were a fire in your kitchen, which is where most fires start in, in households, you would not be able to leave. And the bedrooms are down the hall. Um, did that wow. ever cross your mind for you and your children? And the host um, told me every single night, Lynn, every single night I lay in bed wondering if that's going to happen. She's like, sometimes I even get up and I double check things to make sure that they're off or triple check in case one of the kids woke up and cooked something in the middle of the night. Um, she's like, it's, it's certainly something that uh, runs through her head every day. And if I hadn't lived and, and stayed in public housing, just visiting for an hour or two, ev even if I went every day, I would not have realized something as significant as that unless I was laying in that apartment trying to go to sleep knowing that that's a, a fear, a real fear um, of, of mine. So, um, you know, that's an experience that I was able to glean that I would not have gotten otherwise. Um, obviously also just the fact that um, your safety, um, I was constantly uh, looking over my shoulder. I moved in without any security. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, ironically, the residents kind of became my pseudo bodyguards because they were very protective of me. Wow. Um, they really took me in as one of their own. It was quite humbling experience. Um, I had to earn that. You know, I always say, don't judge me now. Judge me six to eight months from now when change is actually being done on the ground. Um, and, th and they respected that. They appreciated that sort of candor. I wasn't there like a politician trying to get votes. I was there actually trying to effectuate change, and, I, and change is not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen, and that's what I made sure to tell them. So, you know, you've had some time now to reflect on this experience mm. that you had, and you obviously, you know, inherited a lot of, uh, as you said, uh, you know, mismanagement that has, you know, led to the current situation. Have you, have, has that experience led to any new policy ideas that you've been discussing with of Secretary? Of course, of course. So, so HUD provides the funding for the New York City Public Housing Authority. The mayor is responsible for its daily operation and right. hiring. And, um, you know, it reminded me of an experience that I had at the Trump Organization where I worked for 10 years prior to this. Um, the Trump family acquired a, a, a winery in Charlottesville, Virginia, okay. a couple of years back, owned by the former Kluge family. When we were going through a lot of outstanding invoices because they acquired it through a bankruptcy, um, we came across an invoice from Lowe's, you know, like Home Depot. The previous owner had rented a power washer for three years instead of buying one. Now your average power washer is about 500 bucks. You can even get them for $150. She was renting one for about $150 a day. Um, by the time she, we returned it and actually paid for the bill, it was almost $33,000. And what I like to say is that NYCHA is an amalgamation of power washers. They're just not using the money the right way. They are renting boilers for 10, 12 years instead of just buying them. Uh, they are, uh, you know, storing brand new equipment and doors and floody basements that then, you know, they have to discard because they grow mold and they're water damaged. Right. It's just incompetence at the utmost level. And that's really sort of the culture that we have to change. Um, and that's why Secretary Carson has appointed for the first time in history at NYCHA, a federal monitor that has the authority to actually restructure um, NYCHA's organizational charts and make sure that um, folks, you know, if their jobs are relevant, they stay. If they're not relevant, he can eliminate those positions and that's what he's doing. He's also going through with a fine tooth comb with his team of forensic accountants to find out where the $30 million per week that this administration gives NYCHA is going because it's, it's definitely not going to repairs. Um, I could be the first to confirm that. Right.
Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, quite disgusting um, that taxpayer money is being misappropriated. Um, a lot of it is going to union sort of overtime. Um, Four hundred million the mayor has spent on union overtime wages, not salary, just strictly overtime. Okay. And it'd be one thing if he said to me, Lynn, we've spent four hundred million on overtime, but look at everything we've we've actually repaired and accomplished. Okay. Then I might say, you know what? It's still a lot of money, but at least the residents are living in, in better homes. But when you spend four hundred million dollars and literally have nothing to show forth. Um, you still have huge rats, you still have tons of mold, you still have lead paint um, that you falsified uh, inspecting. You have broken elevators where the elderly are sleeping in the lobby because they can't climb, you know, 17 flights of steps. Um, it's, you have heat and hot water going off in record numbers. Um, last year, more than 80% of NYCHA residents lost heat or hot water at some point. Um, during the winter. And again, that's like the city of Miami losing air conditioning. 80% of the city of Miami, it's, it's unprecedented and unacceptable. This is the United States of America, and more importantly, it's New York City, which I personally consider the greatest city in the world. Basically appointing a federal monitor. Yes. Some people might say, well, that seems like an example of gross federal overreach. Like, shouldn't these people be able to figure <laughs> things out locally? Well, you would think so, and we've given them that opportunity, and over the last decade, they have failed miserably. Um, you know, the situation has gotten uh, exponentially worse, and even since I've been here, um, it's gotten worse, um, meaning we have taken sort of a back seat and sat back and, and watched and tried to, um, you know, guide NYCHA as best as possible, but that's just not working. And anybody, I was actually just saying to uh, an elected official today, anybody on the ground in New York knows that NYCHA is completely incapable of turning itself around. Secretary Carson, um, one of, when, when I spoke with him some months ago, mm -hmm. he was talking about how the HUD policies today, the goal is basically to empower people themselves to basically you know, lift themselves up um, uh, potentially yes. even out of uh, needing to have uh, <laughs> of uh, housing and so forth. So how, what, what kind of policies are being implemented well, now like this? So it's unfortunate because I think public housing started off with good intentions, but ultimately what it ended up doing was siloing poverty and siloing opportunity away from uh, real opportunity. And so what you have now are people who are living in public housing for for decades, um, sometimes uh, multi-generational. And, and that's not what its original purpose was, um, I think we all know. Um, so this administration is really focusing on paths to self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary Carson believes that it's our responsibility not just to write a check, but to uh, empower people um, with that money. So. We are focusing on programs such as um, Jobs Plus, which is uh, uh, available at nine different NYCHA properties where they're helping out with um, resume building, uh, skill set training, okay. uh, things like that. Um, we have family self-sufficiency, which allows folks to save money without being penalized. Um, you pay 30% of your rent if you are a public housing resident. I mean, I'm sorry, you pay 30% of your income for rent if you're a public housing resident. And um, we are making sure that if you maybe braid hair on the side or drive an Uber on the side and make more money, that you're not being penalized if you save that. Um, if you right. put that away um, instead of spending it, then we will make sure we don't count that savings against your actual monthly rent. So these are things that um, folks are taking advantage of and we're really excited. So let's switch gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just there's a the fairly new I think HUD initiative that involves um, you know home owners being able to leverage opportunity zones. Oh, I'm wondering yes, if you could speak to zones. that a little bit. Well, you know um, the uh, Tax Bill and Jobs Act of 2017, which was uh, the Trump tax bill, ended up uh, sort of describing a, a new initiative. 
um, that really was the brainchild of Senator Tim Scott and also Steve Mnuchin of the Department of Treasury, right. where um, investors are being given tax breaks to put money back into these communities. And the opportunity zones are identified through census tracts, where um, I think uh, it's 20% poverty level um, or more. And they're all over New York and New Jersey. There's not one municipality in New Jersey without one. There's not one um, NYCHA borough without one. So we're really excited and we're having summits all across um, the country right now um, in conjunction with the White House to educate people on how to take advantage of these opportunities so folks can take uh, the tax breaks incentives that they get from investing back into their communities. And, and how, do they, how do they access that? Well, they have, we're in the process of creating funder groups right now, which will help um, funnel money into the uh, neighborhoods and opportunity zones. And also, obviously, through developers, through architects, through um, a lot of corporate of America. You know, um, one of the reasons why Trump even gave this tax break is so that companies could invest back into their employees, back into their communities. Um, and we saw that that's what was happening. Folks were getting bonus checks for the first time. They were getting raises for the first time. Companies were expanding for the first time. And we want them to expand back into these communities. So um, there are several websites that will provide um, lists of funding uh, contracts, uh, I'm sorry, funders, yeah. and, and folks that can uh, help uh, steer investors on the right track. Okay, great, and we can, well, we can put those up yeah, right now. Yeah, exactly, the, <laughs> tweet uh, them out. Exactly. One of the things when I was uh, speaking also with uh, Secretary Carson uh, mm -hmm. uh, a while back, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things he was talking about with me was um, that President Trump has been experiencing kind of unpre what you would call, you know, un unprecedented attacks, or at least unprecedented recent history um, um, attacks yes. against his person, against his, his policies, against his families, and so forth. And 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 Secretary Carson said, "Well, you know, he didn't need this, right?" <laughs> and 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 as I was as we were talking, it struck me, you know, Secretary Carson himself was kind of in the same kind of in the same he boat. Is. Um, he, he is. In right. fact, he had just purchased, I think, a, a new house in Palm Beach. He was getting ready to retire, play some golf, um, and the president came calling, asking if, the, if Secretary Carson or if Dr. Ben Carson would serve his country. And, you know, it's funny because um, I was saying the same thing to somebody else the other day is, uh, here's a guy, and it's so completely tragic. Here's a doctor who has separated literally dozens of conjoined twins around the country, around the world. Um, he has earned probably uh, the greatest reputation of being one of the most renowned neurosurgeons in the entire globe. And now when he Googles his name, up pops an article about a $31,000 dining room table. And it's a shame because, uh, Jan, what's gonna end up happening is that folks like Dr. Carson Folks who are successful in, in industry or business or, or, or some sort of um, trade are, are not going to become public servants because where is the incentive? Um, you're going to be bashed incessantly. You're going to be scrutinized relentlessly. Um, you can even be threatened physically like many conservatives have been this, this uh, administration, including myself. So that, that exactly. So you, you know, you're also in the same boat. You know, you've you spent ten years in the Trump organization. You, you were incredibly successful mm -hmm. by all accounts. Um, how, how is it that you ended up in this role? <laughs> well, you know, unlike a lot of my counterparts who have been interested in politics their entire lives or or wanted to serve their country um, through a housing agency. I just happened to be working at a company where my boss ran for president and actually won. So here I am. Um, you know, one of the things that happened shortly after he won, um, you might remember he went to uh, Club, the 21 Club here in New York okay. um, for dinner with his family. 
And uh, the next day, I got a text from Eric Trump, and it said, uh, you know, you didn't tell me my father wanted to take you to Washington, D.C. And I was like, he does? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So that was something that um, was really quite an honor, um, you know, when the President of the United States or President-elect asks you to serve your country. Uh, how do you say no to that? So originally I was going to go work in the White House uh, with him, uh, but I felt that I had personally made some promises to the American people on the campaign trail with him, particularly okay. those in rural and minority um, or urban areas. And so I felt that I could do him a greater service by being someplace he wasn't, which was an agency. And, um, you know, of course, I was there at the Trump Tower when he reached out to Ben Carson and asked if right. he would serve his country. And so it was an honor. Um, my family has known the Carson family for quite some time. My father's also a doctor. So it was an honor to be able to go work for who I consider to be my second favorite person in Washington, D.C., which is Dr. Ben Carson. And so that's what I did. I went and worked at HUD. And then, of course, I was with him for eight months in D.C., and when the opportunity presented itself to basically come back home and serve my community and the neighborhoods that I know best, um, I seized the moment. You know, back in February, uh, you went to Congress. Yes. And, um, uh, you know, to testify uh, at the same time that Michael Cohen was testifying. Um, specific well, I want to clarify, yeah. I, I was never planning to testify. My mere presence was supposed to serve as a reminder to Michael Cohen that integrity and honesty still matter in this country. And he knows that I know the truth, and he knows that I know he wasn't telling it. So, you know, you were accused uh, of being, you know, the, the token person yes. of color or yes. something of this nature. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you make of this? Well, you know, it's sad because clearly what that represents is uh, first of all, evidently, races, calling out racism is the new racism, right? Because a lot of people thought that that was a racist comment for the congresswoman from Michigan to say. Um, but that aside, I think the reason why I was so viciously attacked is because I don't represent um, what the expectation of a, a black female um, is supposed to be in terms of mindset and voting record. Um, and also, you know, I was there, God forbid, with my own opinion about a man who I've known for 10 years. Um, and also, I've known Michael Cohen for 15, even longer. Um, I was there based on my personal experience. I was never there to represent my entire race. I was there to represent one person who is the President of the United States of America, who I know just as well as Michael Cohen. So my question to the Congresswoman from Michigan was, how is it that you take the opinion and statements of a criminally convicted, self-confessed white male perjurer over that of a fellow minority female who rose up through the ranks of the Trump organization from assistant to vice president, then spoke at the Republican National Convention in front of 24 million people and is now the highest ranking uh, African-American female in the Trump administration. Um, to me, that's much more racist than uh, being called a token. Um, you know, uh, the fact that she didn't think I had my own opinion about this man um, and what he was saying. Look, um, I think any one of us in this room could tell you it doesn't take 15 years to figure out somebody's a racist unless you're making that up. Um, I think we all know folks in our families, our circles, our jobs who have said inappropriate things um, and uh, we know who they are pretty quickly. Um, so for Michael Cohen to say that Trump is a racist, it's just not true. Um, he wouldn't have worked for him as long as he did if he were. I would not have worked for him still if he were. Um, again, I don't need this job. I don't need the money. Um, I'm here because I'm serving my country under a man who has served me very well. You know, a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, look, I'm the type of person who uh, judges folks um, by their actions more so than their words. And 
the Trump family and the president have really stood by me on multiple occasions, on a personal and professional level. They gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. Um, they recognized my work when I did it. Um, again, going from literally a personal assistant to a vice president, um, they put me in charge of all of their philanthropy, um, determining which altruistic causes deserved attention. Um, it was an honor to run Eric Trump's charity uh, for seven years of that time, uh, where we gave almost $16 million to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Things that you just don't read about in the paper. Right. Um, you know, uh, I was just looking at a stat the other day. You know, uh, in 2014, the Eric Trump Foundation raised $2 million. We gave almost 90% of that to charity. In 2014, that same year, the Clinton Foundation raised $91 million and ended up giving only 5% to charity. Um, you know, why is that not a headline? Those are the types of things that really get my goat, especially when you know how giving this family is. Again, you said it yourself, the president did not need to do this. Um, I can tell you as a, a fact, his plane is nicer. You know, as much as I respect Air Force One, um, you know, some folks might argue that, uh, I know Howard Stern has said it, Mar-a-Lago is nicer. <laughs> you know, uh, this guy could have just sat back and, and flown around and, and done all the same things that he's basically um, doing now, but without the heartache and stress. But um, what really touched me so much, and sometimes I get emotional even just thinking about it, is his love for this country is really what drove him to give all that up. And to be a part of that is something that is the greatest honor of my life. So how do I not give it up? How does the secretary not give it up themselves um, when you see somebody so selfless? Um, and it's particularly hard when you see and you know from a personal perspective the type of vitriol and hate mail and threats that they get on a daily basis, you know? Um, from the moment my boss came down the escalator, I've been called Coon, Uncle Tom, House Negro, um, uh, Shiboon, words that I had to like actually look up because Is I've never heard mean, them before. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's and, and the tragedy of it all is it's primarily coming from folks of my own race. Um, you know, uh, the tragedy of being a minority conservative is something that a lot of people don't really recognize. You know, not only do we have uh, the daily hurdles of any minority, and of course the daily hurdles of any female, but you also have the additional albatross of, of being conservative, and that sometimes um, can be uh, a detriment, and, and you've seen it uh, firsthand by the way I was received at that hearing. If I had been a, a white female um, who happened to work um, for the Trump Organization for over 10 years and know both Michael Cohen and the president equally, they would never have questioned my presence there. They would have said, here's a girl who's standing here um, and, and her mere presence symbolizes that somebody is here to push back. And I wasn't there to just push back against the racist narrative. I was there to push back against every single narrative <laughs> that basically Michael Cohen was raising because I knew when he was lying. Um, Michael Cohen and I were inseparable. We went to lunch almost every day. I was in his office all the time. He was down um, on my floor constantly. Um, we traveled together. We uh, went to dinner together. I know his family. I know his wife. I know his kids. Um, you know, I talked to him even after his offices were raided, even after his home was raided. Um, I talked to his daughter after that happened. Um, it was extremely traumatic. I was close to them. Um, and, you know, when he started talking about some of the things during the, te the testimony about not wanting to ever work for this administration, never wanting to have gone to the White House, I was texting folks, letting them know that those were just bold-faced lies um, and that we had evidence of that. And I personally did as well. And so, um, you know, my presence there was to really um, let Michael know, again, that truth and integrity matter and that 
I am going to look you in the eyes as you lie to the American people, and I'm going to call you out on it and make sure that these uh, congressmen call you out on it too. So, you know, you think in, in his case he's just was afraid of the jail time. He wanted to minimize that. Without a doubt. And also, um, I actually posted something in my Instagram, uh, which later was confirmed by the media. But, you know, they threatened to jail his family, uh, his wife in particular. Yes. Um, and so, and I knew that because he had told me so. Um, you know, uh, the media ignored my post and chose to believe, again, a self-convicted -conv uh, perjurer instead, but um, you know when folks threaten you, you might be able to uh, hold it together and kind of be tough. But when they start threatening your family or your in-laws, or it makes you it know, all the more difficult. It makes it all the more difficult. And when you start threatening uh, family members and things like that, and look, I want to remind everybody watching this that Michael Cohen is not in jail for anything the president of the United States or the campaign did. He's in jail because he obtained a personal loan by falsifying the value of his taxi medallions. He's in jail because he misappropriated funds to right. pay off um, Stormy Daniels um, from a home loan, um, which is considered bank fraud. And he's in jail because he didn't pay his taxes personally. And so, um, you know, no different than Paul Manafort. These folks are uh, in jail for crimes that had nothing to do with the President of the United States um, or the campaign. Um, and in fact, I think the Mueller uh, report said the exact opposite. Um, and so, uh, but you know what? I welcome these investigations, as sick as it sounds, because the American people want to move on. And while Democrats are asking for tax returns and, and all kinds of uh, uh, additional investigations, we'll be addressing student loan reform. We'll be addressing, uh, you know, uh, prison reform. We'll be addressing uh, ways to uh, fix the infrastructure of this country. We'll continue to put numbers on the board that drop, uh, you know, the unemployment rate and raise the GDP. And, and then you tell me which is more effective and helpful for this country. So you're, you know, Lynn, you're obviously very deeply committed to this work. <laughs> and thank you for, yeah. for being so, so open thank about you. that. How, but death threats, how do you deal with that? Well, you know, um, I certainly, look, who am I? I certainly don't get them in the numbers uh, that this family has gotten them. In fact, I was uh, with Eric and Laura um, when Laura called and said she had uh, just opened up an envelope where white powder spilled all over her body and all over their dog. And it was quite a, an experience that uh, I would never forget. Um, you know, who do these people think they are? Um, you know, that you would have that much hatred and, and vitriol for somebody um, who's really uh, just ideals you don't agree with. Um, it, it just seems so extreme and, and, and balanced. And of course, we know that that's exactly what it is. But what's sad is when, you know, the media gives sort of, um, credence to this type of behavior. Um, and look, there are bad apples on both sides of the aisle. Um, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, and none of us condone any sort of violence or, or, or threats in any way, shape, or form. But, um, you know, uh, as soon as I spoke at the Republican National Convention back in Cleveland, um, my life changed. Um, and I would, I would like to say for the better, but it also changed for the worse. Um, you know, uh, my town where I live in Connecticut had to do uh, more frequent drive-bys, my parents' house, um, just because they were concerned, the police. Uh, you know, there were uh, threats coming to my apartment because folks figured out where I lived. Um, even when I stayed in NYCHA uh, public housing, um, while I was away, my boyfriend was getting uh, threats and, and sort of um, hate mail um, at our apartment in uh, Westchester that, uh, because the media published where I lived, um, you know. Right. Uh, that's right. And it's interesting because, you know, they went through great pains not to publish where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez lives. Um, they basically described her building in D.C., but they never said the name of the building or, or the address. 
But for me, it was like, oh, Lynn lives in, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, obviously, it's easy to find, and um, it's certainly uh, been a, an issue uh, for, of, of safety for me. You mentioned uh, earlier the media gives credence to this sort of behavior. Can you explain what you meant by that exactly? Well, sure. I think that, um, you know, when folks threaten um, certain people in uh, the Trump family, uh, the media, it's not covered as much. Um, whereas if, if there's a threat against um, uh, maybe uh, a, a, a Democratic congressman, uh, that gets wall-to-wall -wall coverage, for example. Um, you know, uh, I can try to think of a specific so, but example it, it right makes, now. But you feel it makes people feel like they can do this because they, can, they won't get called it on it as easily. Them because right. they don't get called out on it. Right. Um, case in point, um, you know, the Colorado shooter um, from two weeks ago right. hates Trump all over their social media. Trump this, Trump that, um, all, all bad stuff. Um, I read that in one place um, since the tragedy. And of course, the tragedy is a greater issue, but you can bet your bottom dollar that if somebody had shot up the school and had you know anti-Joe Biden stuff all over their Facebook, we'd be seeing it a lot more in the media. So there's this disconnect and sort of, um, you know, uh, I would say hypocr hypocrisy um, with respect to how um, threats are, are treated by, um, look, Kellyanne Conway, uh, Sarah Huckabee, they get uh, uh, threatened and assaulted in public all the time. We saw Sarah get kicked out of a restaurant. We've seen uh, Kellyanne Conway get assaulted physically in front of her children. Um, you know, nothing happened. If that happened to uh, Hillary Clinton or Ocasio-Cortez, I think we would be seeing a, a lot greater backlash. Um, and, and those are just facts. You know, it's, it's sad, but, um, you know, uh, that's where we are in, in society right now. How do we chart in your mind, you know, how do we chart a course uh, to, to become better here? Well, I think the course that this president is charting is to focus on the issues. Um, that matter to the American people, which is infrastructure, health care, student loan reform, prison reform, um, you know, opportunity zones. Uh, he's uh, focused veterans' uh, rights and access. Um, he's doing a lot of things that um, other presidents uh, have only talked about doing. Um, of course, uh, what we were talking about earlier equal trade with foreign countries, taking us out of um, the Paris Accord Agreement, you know, um, taking us out of, uh, well, demanding equal uh, contributions in NATO. Um, and he's getting results, um, you know, um, the uh, Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, right. things that are are making uh, life better for Americans as opposed to worse. Um, these are things that, uh, look, the president came down that escalator and said America first, and he meant it. Um, and I think that uh, when it comes to uh, homelessness, um, housing, uh, benefits, um, med free Medicare, Medicaid, these are things that need to go to Americans first, veterans first, people have served, who have served our country first, um, you know, and that's what he's uh, focusing on, um, not just for Americans, but also for, uh, you know, the, the due diligence of our taxpayers. Um, that's where they would want their money to go. So I saw you in another interview recently actually talk about uh, the situation of aid in Puerto Rico. I saw it, it looked like you were quite oh, yes. passionate about that. Well, you know, um, Puerto Rico used to be in Region 2. Um, it was New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico, oh, okay. and the Virgin Islands. But they actually moved it from Region 2 to Region 4 about 14 years ago. So I've never had the benefit of, of serving the Puerto Rican community. But one of the things that frustrates me so much is, um, you know, you see all of the backlash about um, 
the aid that's been getting there, um, you know. Or the lack of it. Or the lack of it, thank right, you. Right. Um, you know, Secretary Carson and President Trump signed the largest disaster bill in federal history for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, over $20 billion. Um, we've delivered half of that money already. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that folks watching and reading the newspaper or clicking the clickbait headlines that are Puerto Rico, you know, not getting federal funding. What a lot of folks who click that bait don't realize is there's something called an action plan amendment that every uh, disaster region must submit in order to get the funding that has been earmarked for them. So, uh, for example, Texas submitted it, Florida submitted it. Puerto Rico has only submitted an action plan amendment for the amount of money we have given them. We cannot give them more than what they've submitted a plan for because, again, one of the things that we're learning is that there's a lot of money left over from Ike that Puerto Rico hasn't spent. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that the money is going to the right places on the ground, that we don't see the kind of deception or fraud that happened with Hurricane Katrina. So by law, the territory of Puerto Rico has to fill this plan out. And if it's not filled out, then they don't get the money. And they've filled out, um, I think, uh, an action plan amendment for at least $8 billion, and we've given that to them. So there's a disconnect in what's being reported in the news and what's being, um, you know, what's factual. Um, and we're just rolling that money out to them staggering it because we want to make sure OMB wants to make sure that it's actually going to the right people. Um, you know, whenever there's a disaster, unfortunately, a lot of folks swoop in and take advantage of what they know is going to be tons of federal money and contracts. Right. And uh, we just can't have that happen to the Puerto Rican people. Um, we can't afford to not repair that island uh, back to its original beauty. And we want to make sure that the money being earmarked for, by the American taxpayers is doing exactly that. So, Lynn, uh, any final words you want to share? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, I want folks to be able to give this president a chance. Um, you know, I get a lot of times, you're a black female. How on earth do you reconcile working for this man? He's never said those things, uh, and what I, what I would want people to leave with is that, you know, this administration has created an urban council that's now going to invest over $100 billion through Opportunity Zones into urban and rural communities. This administration has given uh, maybe $40 million more to historically black colleges and, and universities than the Obama administration. This administration has also passed the single most uh, progressive uh, prison reform bill um, in the last three decades. Um, and those aren't my words. Van Jones said that. Um, you know, we are uh, changing the lives and, and, and future of, of minority and rural Americans every day. And, and that's something that I'm a proud, that I'm very proud to be a part of. Just want to clarify one thing. You mm -hmm. said uh, he never said those words or he never said that. What, what were you referring to oh, specifically? Well, I'm specifically yeah. referring to, you know, the typical things that folks bring up when they bring up racism uh, in my boss. Uh, one of those is, is Charlottesville. You know, the argument that he said there are good people. Um, on both fine, sides. Right. Fine, fine, fine people on fine both people sides. Fine people on both sides. Right. Even CNN, I think, did a recent report admitting that that phrase has been twisted over the years um, and, and sort of manifest its, its, into its own sort of um, uh, fake news, shall I say. Um, what he said was that they're the original uh, procurers of that permit to protest um, were historians, some of them professors at UVA, um, who did not want the removal of Confederate statues, period. Um, not because they worshiped Confederate soldiers or thought that they were on the right side of history, but because 
they knew that you know those who erase history are doomed to repeat it and these are just historic monuments um, and that need to be respected as such um, that this world is getting too PC so when he said that there were fine people what he clearly meant and he said it a million times is that he meant the folks who had originated that protest um, it wasn't until later that obviously these neo-Nazis came marching down with their tiki torches and ruined the entire affair. But, um, you know, and Trump has denounced those folks many, many right. times, right. Uh, repeatedly. So I like to make sure that folks um, understand that you need the entire context when you judge someone. Um, you know, and again, I've had the benefit of having his entire context for 10 years. And look, racists just don't raise children like Ivanka, Don, Eric, Barron, and Tiffany. They just don't. Um, they are some of the most giving, altruistic people I've ever met. Their spouses are the same way. Um, you know, uh, if, they, if, if Trump, their father, were racist, that would have shown its ugly head at some point, whether it be in a, in a back room joke or, or some sort of slip up. Um, and I've been with them nonstop for, for almost a decade now, and I've never heard anything like that come out of their mouths. Um, you know, you're taught racism. Uh, you learn it. And uh, they have never been exposed to that sort of environment and never will be. Um, Lynn, thanks so much for taking the time and opening up here. Thank on, you, Jan. On Again, it's been a pleasure, and, and I really appreciate you having me here today.